welcome. We, we, we love that you are here. Thank you, Sam and Judy, for your hosting us this morning. Um, <clears throat> few quick things that are going on, you know, some maybe uh, for a prayer. This coming Saturday is the Lower Pacific Districts Conference and uh, AGM, and that's from 10 till noon on Zoom, and so be in prayer for that. There, I think there are some uh, bylaw changes they're making and things like that, so pray for that. We have our own AGM next Sunday evening at 6.30. Next Sunday morning is communion. We get to share in that together. So uh, yeah, thank you. If, um, if you did not specify that you were gonna pick up your giving receipt from the church office, it has been mailed. So there are, I think a few that are here where people called and said, we, we will pick it up. Otherwise your receipt is mailed. So don't come around looking for it. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I'm gonna pray one more time and then we're gonna, get into today's uh, sermon, talk, whatever you want to call it. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, and just for the way you work things together and even uh, with Tim's leading us in songs and Psalm 23, we store in our soul and pray that we would through everything that is done this morning, that our souls would be restored a little bit more into that communion with you. We live in what are strange times to us, not really unprecedented. The world has been through these things before, uh, but they are probably new to most of us. And so we just thank you and pray for those who govern us, the authorities over us, that you will give them wisdom. Uh, I think we're probably all getting a little bit tired of this, but we pray for perfect perseverance. And also for opportunities that as we go through this, that we would have opportunities to share the good news of who Jesus is with those around us. Be able to share how you enable us and you sustain us and you fill us and you give us joy and hope in the midst of such weirdness. We pray that as we uh, share uh, in your word and, and talk about what that means to us today, that uh, you would take your word and that you will um, use it to penetrate each one of our hearts and our souls and our minds, uh, that we would become a little bit more like you. So thank you for this time today. Uh, and thank you for each person that is here. Thank you for your presence with each one of us as we gather. And uh, yeah, we pray that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth here and in our lives as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we've been doing a sermon series on uh, our vision statement, Pursuing Jesus in Community. And a couple of weeks ago, Ryan talked about the idea of pursuing. And last, last week, I talked about pursuing Jesus. One of the things I did last week, I talked a lot about the how. And I had a lot of points in relation to that. And at the end, I touched on the why. And yet the why pursue Jesus is probably the more important piece of that. There's many ways, the, there's many hows, but the why is probably the most important. So I just want to start there again this morning. Because why pursue Jesus? Because nobody else in history had done, did do, or will do what Jesus did. Stop and think about what Jesus did. What did he do? It was God becoming flesh, fully God, fully man, identifying with humanity uh, and, and in order to deal with humanity's core issues, to deal with sin, to deal with death, to deal with bondage, to deal with guilt, darkness, fear, and shame. He canceled our debt on the cross because he paid our ransom. Think of yourself as having been kidnapped 
And Jesus paid the ransom and set you free. Can you imagine anybody having been kidnapped and somebody pays a ransom and they go, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go back. I don't, I'm going to stay in this situation of bondage and hardship. But no, Jesus paid the ransom. He made the payment and he did it with his own flesh for all of humanity. Even those who reject that. The price has been paid even if you reject it. And he rescued us. I love this is kind of taken from Colossians 1. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light through the forgiveness of our sin. That is the ultimate restoring of our soul. But the question we still have to ask is, so what? If he didn't do that, and if you don't receive that gift by depending on what he did, appropriating it, claiming it, then here's the reality. Then you are still living in sin, living in guilt, still dealing with freight, uh, shame, still living in fear. But the reality is that Jesus sets us free from all of that. We don't need to, we don't need to live with guilt. We don't need to live with shame. E even if it's shame that where things have been done to you by others, you don't need to feel shame because he loves you. You don't need to live in fear or in bondage. So that's the pursuing Jesus. That's the why. But today, we want to talk about pursuing Jesus in community. So what is community? If you think about a definition, what do you come up with? I came across this one this week. A social, religious, occupational, or other group sharing common characteristics or interests and perceived or perceiving itself as distinct in some respect from the larger society within which it exists. So it's your identification with a particular group for some reason. Sometimes community is identified as a neighborhood. That's a pretty common one. Uh, it could be a, a workplace can be a community because you share that environment. Uh, you Maybe you have a, we have a community of faith because we share certain beliefs. How many communities do you live in? you probably have a number, some of us more than others, but we all live in community, whether we like it or not. And maybe you're, you're more introverted than extroverted. I think actually more of us are introverts than we like to acknowledge, but the reality is uh, there are environments in, in which we share community. A synonym that I came across for community was correspondence. In other words, the, we, we have things in our life that correspond to other people's lives or likeness. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. So with which communities are you affiliated? In Western thought, we tend to live in a rugged individualism. And, and more and more, our own culture and society is becoming less Western uh, as we have this globalization in our world and in our community. We have people who come from a, a less Western thought, maybe a more Eastern thought, um, where we are focused on guilt and innocence and the individual. Some are focused more on shame and honor and upon family and tribes and, and that. Much of our community is focused on that. Then there is the fear and power culture, which is focused on the supernatural and appeasing appeasing uh, supernatural forces and trying to harness that power. And we have all of that around us. But for those of us who have grown up in Western thought, we, are, we have this rugged individualism. So I, I was asking people this week, what is the opposite? What's the opposite of community? One person said, Self-sufficiency, and I thought, oh, well, there, there's one I haven't thought of, self-sufficiency, because you don't need other people. The, the thought that came to my mind is that the opposite of community would be 
isolation, separation. Um, isolation is defined as the failure of an individual to maintain contact with others or genuine communication where interaction with others persists. Other words that come up were seclusion, aloneness, antagonism, which is interesting because that would that would represent those who, you know, where community, you identify with people who have similar interests to you. The opposite of the community would be antagonism where people do not share your interests. And we definitely do see that in this world today. Uh, separation or segregation. So there's community and there's isolation. So when we're talking about pursuing Jesus in community, we are talking about sharing uh, life together in actually three communities in which we affiliate. Because Jesus exists in those three communities, and those are community with God, and we're going to talk about each one of these a little bit, and in the next three weeks, we're going to expound a little bit more on each of these communities. Next week, Tim will talk about community with God, and what does that mean? The following week is, is the second community, community with one another, and Matthias will talk about that. And then the last one is community for the world, and I will wrap up our series with that one. And each of these communities, community with God, community with one another, community for the world, are not isolated communities either. There is crossover between these because if, if Jesus is in each one of these communities and we are in Jesus, then we are in each one of these and they cross over into each of our lives. And we need all three. If you think about community, those three communities, with God, with one another, for the world, and you examine your life, and you're missing one, you are missing out. We need all three of these in our lives. So let's talk about the first one, community with God. We speak of God as being three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one God, united in their essence, united in character. They share the same qualities. They, sh they have the same purpose and they have one will, but they are unique, and they function uniquely and in distinction from one another. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each have different functions that they fulfill within the Trinity. Uh, they're not totally, in a sense, clones of one another. In the same way that as individuals, we are in community and and even you know this is why i think god created marriage to show us that there are male and there are female and we have unique functions and yet we can be united in marriage as having one purpose and sharing our lives so god is in essence and in himself <clears throat> excuse me community and his purpose is to invite us into that community with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Think about that for a moment. <clears throat> the God who created the universe, who sustains all things, who keeps your heart beating when you're sleeping and your lungs breathing while you're sleeping and, and keeps you alive, invites you into community with him. God's heart is a heart of invitation. He welcomes humanity into his goodness. And this is a humanity that has rejected him, that is rebellious toward him, and yet he invites us into community with him. Why did God do that? Was he lonely? Did God need company? No. He's completely when we talk about that self-sufficiency, God is self-sufficient, and especially with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is community. God was not lonely, and yet he desired to invite us into that. Why? Well, one of the things is that when he created us, he created us in his image. And part of that image is that we were created for community. 
if God is community and we are created in his likeness, we are create, created for community. We are not created to be to live in isolation or to be a lone ranger, as it were. So Genesis 1.27 tells us we are created in his image. It's interesting in, is, is in the creation account as that is expanded in chapter 2 and, and talks about the responsibilities that Adam had and God observing Adam and going, it's not good for man to be alone. We are not designed to be alone. And so God created Eve, God created woman to be, to share life together. And so God created us in his image to be in community. And when we think about the greatest commandment, what, what is that greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To pursue God. And he desires for us to love him. And we love him because he first loved us. He created us. We rejected that. And yet he, he, he pursued us. So we we're created, created to be in community with God. If we are not in community with God, there is an emptiness. There is a vacuum in our soul uh, that goes unfulfilled. And we need to have that. But flowing out of that community with God is the idea of community with one another. In the same way that in the Godhead, there is community between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Within his people, there is to be community with one another. And, and the second great commandment is in, love God first, love one another's. And, and Jesus gave us a new commandment. He said, I give, I give you a new commandment, John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You know, it, I'm just thinking about where I receive love and what that looks like. You know, and my, my wife does wonderful little things for me. You know, she gets up before me and she goes off to work and I get up and you know what? Sometimes the coffee maker is set up so I just have to click a button. Just a little token of love toward me. And yet, you know, uh, God has got, extended so much more love toward us and the love that we can express to one another. We cannot pursue Jesus in community with one another unless we are in community with God. Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't give up meeting together. At least, at least do it via Zoom if you can't gather in person. And, and the purpose of that is to encourage one another, to build one another up. There are so many one another's in the New Testament, the one another's to bear one another's burdens, to restore one another. If one of you is caught in sin, you who are spiritual, restore one another. Love one another. Be patient with one another. Read Romans 12. Read 1 Corinthians 13 for some of those one another's. In Acts chapter 2, and we often look at to this as the ideal church and and you know what it was great but it wasn't perfect as we see as you continue to read through the narrative of acts that there were things that were going on in the early church that needed correction but in in acts chapter two it was described as as constantly gathering together to learn to be together to meet one another's needs to share meals together which we can't do except in your household right now to share at the Lord's table, to break bread, both in, in, in a social way and in a sacred way. To pray together and to worship together. As I said in John 13, 34, Jesus gave us this new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And the way that he loved us is that he gave himself up for us. And we're to love one another in community by giving ourselves up for one another. 
And what, when we do that, it says, by this, people will know that you are my disciples. Your faith is not a private matter just between you and God. And I'm sure we all know people who choose not to get together with God's people, to fellowship with God's people. They maybe have experienced uh, some hardship. They've been burnt, so to speak. Uh, somebody wronged them or they observed some wrong in the church. That is always going to be the case. We are human beings and, and we are going to fail. And, and people are going to wrong you. Even believers will wrong you. But your faith cannot be in those people. Again, you need to have that community with God that helps you have grace for community with one another. And that, that love and that grace that has been extended to you, you extend to one another. Tim used a phrase this week, and I, and I liked it. it, it the Christian, Christian community is the training ground for learning to love people that you may not like. I remember being in a community group, a small group, and we, we call ourselves, well, I call this the Isle of Misfits, because there was no, no reason for us to be a community group. We were sort of, you know, the, the leftovers from the popular or pretty people in the church, and yet we got together and as time went on, and as we shared life together, there was a love that developed between us uh, that I would say continues to this day. And that is the nature of Christian love. When we're in community with God and we share in community with one another, uh, this love grows. It's that training ground for, that you live with people, you share with people, you give yourself for other people that you might not otherwise even talk to or socialize with. But that is the nature of Christian love in community with one another. So as I said, your faith is not a private matter between you and God. And so when the world observes this, they, they will see us and as Jesus said, you love one another this way so that the world will know that you are my disciples. And that is our third community, community for the world. And this is, again, the world in which Jesus exists and in which we are called to, to live. And in our, in our vision statement, we have said uh, community with God, community with one another. But we have said community for the world. And we've made that prepositional distinction for a reason. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are here for the world. We are here to see his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. We are part of God's kingdom. Um, you know, and, and I was read, doing some reading this week, and it talked about the difference between the church and God's kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is a realm, and it has a king. And we are the manifestation of that kingdom. We are the reality of that. We here as, as the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, are here for the kingdom. We, we exist as the kingdom. We are here to be Jesus' representatives to this world. We are, the word ecclesia or ecclesia, depending on how you say it, uh, isn't just a gap group of people. There are people who are called out. It's like a, the herald in a community calling people to gather, and they are gathered for a purpose. We, this morning, we are gathered, even if you didn't feel like it, you know, for a purpose. And part of that purpose is to encourage one another, as the reference in Hebrew said. But we are also, and we are called out from the world, but we are also sent into the world. You know, so we've talked about the greatest commandment, and we also have the great commission. Great commandment, new commandment, great commission, which is go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing and teaching in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit community. And he is with us through it all to the end of the age. 
So we are called out from the world, but we are sent into the world. We are not called to be a holy huddle. This might be one of the, the disappointing things at this point in gathering with Zoom is that the steps that people have to take to gather with us limits uh, the randomness of somebody, say, showing up at church. You know, when we get back to gathering and we start streaming again, that will provide that opportunity for people just to go to our YouTube channel, uh, click a link on our website or our Facebook page and be able to gather with us and see what we are about and not even have to come in into the do through the doors. So it's a, it's a little bit sad in that way that we're a little bit of a holy huddle right now on Zoom, but we still each have the opportunity to be there, to be uh, the representatives of Jesus for the world, to meet those needs. And the primary way we do that, though, is the way that we love one another. That is how Jesus said, the world will know that you are my disciples because you love one another the way that I have loved you. It's not by the programs that we do. It's not by the doctrine that we hold. Those are good things. Those are important things. But it's by love that people will know that we are his disciples. And that all, again, there's, there's that overlap. Community for with God, community with one another. For the world, we are on a mission. We are invited by the community of communities, which is the Trinity, God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to be in community with the Trinity. You just stop right there, and, and that's enough. And he created us for community. To be in community with him, you look back in Genesis, that's what God, Adam and Eve had this wonderful community with God, walking through the garden in the coolness of the evening, enjoying fellowship with him, communing with him, and then rejected that. But with that is what we are created for, is to be in community with him and to be in community with one another, because we were not created to be alone. We were not created to live in isolation. And we know that the worst thing you can do to somebody is put them in, in, uh, in prison is to sit, put them by themselves in isolation. It's considered uh, cruel and un unusual punishment now in Canada. But he desires for us to share that generous invitation that we have experienced with those around us in the world. So again, as you think back, to, we started by talking about what communities are you a part of? Every one of those communities, you have an opportunity to share community with God and with one another for those people to be that light. And as I said, we're going to look at those a lot more in the next three weeks. Community with God, with him. Community with one another, with, with Matthias. And then wrapping up with community for the world. And we're going to look at that a little bit more. I'm going to close this morning with another <clears throat> prayer that I have. This is from the Valley of Vision. It's that collection of Puritan prayers and devotions. And this particular one is called Christian Love. So let me read this for us as we close uh, this part of our service. O lover of the loveless, it is your will that I should love you with heart, soul, mind, strength, and my neighbor as myself. But I am not sufficient for these things. There is by nature no pure love in my soul. Every affection in me is turned from you. I am bound as slave to lust. I cannot love you, lovely as you are, until you do set me free. By grace, I am your freeman and would serve you, for I believe that you are my God in Jesus, and that through him I am redeemed, and my sins are forgiven. With this freedom, I would always obey you, but I cannot walk in li liberty any more than I could first attain it of myself. May your spirit draw me nearer to you and your ways. 
you are the end of all means. For if they lead me not to you, I go away empty. Order all my ways by your holy word and make your commandments the joy of my heart, that by them I may have happy con converse with you. May I grow in your love and manifest it to mankind. Spirit of love, make me like the loving Jesus. Give me his benevolent temper, his beneficent actions, that I may shine before men to your glory. The more you do love in me and, and by me, humble me the more, keep me meek, lowly, and always be ready to give you honor. Amen. song Jesus Amen. 
this Jesus we sing of. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. You were created for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the center. There's no denying that. The question for us is whether we want to live our lives um, in the knowledge of that truth and to grow in our capacity to live within that truth each moment of each day. Uh, go in that hope and that peace um, that he is holding all things together and that you were made for him. Enjoy him today. <laughs>